Good evening. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. We're live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And that's where you're going to find 50 plus interviews with independent and third party candidates who are on the ballot this year, November 8th, 2016, who are the only alternate choice besides your Republican and Democrat status quo candidates. Um, and uh, today's Thursday, September 22nd. Tonight we have an interview with Martin Buchanan, Libertarian, for the U.S. House of Representatives, District 7 in Colorado. So let's give him a call and, and conduct this interview. And, um, and here is uh, issues. All right. This is Martin Buchanan. Hi, Martin. Good evening. This is Thomas Keegan. You're on live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. Fantastic. And hello to your listeners as well, Thomas. All right. Well, that sounds good. And we look forward to this interview. And um, so I already gave you kind of a brief introduction, but um, people can find out more at BuchananForCongress.org, B U C H. A N A N F O R Congress C O N G R E S S dot org, and so, um, well, let me ask you this uh, to start off the conversation here in the interview. Um, how come you're not running as a Republican or Democrat this year? Well, the Republicans have clearly gone crazy. They've nominated a psychopath for president, a man who shouldn't who probably deserves to be in prison for the uh, multiple crimes he's committed notably the fraud of trump university um and uh, the libertarians have long-standing and fundamental differences with both the democrats and the republicans i'm starting to ramble like a politician but essentially both of those parties have gotten us into endless wars endless debt and uh, endless policies that take away our personal freedoms yeah. So you're the only third-party option on the ballot for your district this year. Is that correct? I am. Actually, I was at a meeting a few minutes ago and was sitting right next to a gentleman, uh, David, I don't recall his last name for sure, who had been the Green Party candidate in the same district in uh, a previous election, but he told me there was no Green Party ca- uh, candidate this year. Yeah, yeah. so if someone... Um, even if they're in the Green Party or, or wherever, a disgruntled Republican. I mean, if you look at all the polls, people say throw them all out. So, I mean, giving you a two-year chance, you know, is not as big of a risk. And it's not as um, a partisan as a presidential politics. Uh, so let's look at your issues list here. And, and you do list um, issues on here, everything from uh, peace balance, freedom, no bailouts, don't waste your votes, and, uh, and, and some more here. So um, what about, you know, peace? You know, um, that's very important, peace and prosperity. Um, you go down the list here and, and talk about some of the issues, and then we'll expand it into some follow-ups and uh, some other issues as well. Surely. And peace has got to be the most important thing because um, I've seen – so many unnecessary wars in my lifetime as two examples vietnam which was a completely wrong and unnecessary war a war i marched against and spoke against when i was young and then the iraq war uh started in 2003 which i marched against uh here in denver with i think it was the vietnam veterans for or i don't the, the name it was veterans for peace uh, was the organization i may not have their name correctly but um when we make mistakes in the area of foreign policy, people get killed. Um, we contributed to starting this civil war in Syria by, at, at certain times, encouraging and arming factions in somebody else's civil war. Uh, we got involved in Libya, and, and Libya is a mess right now. We should get entirely out of the Middle East uh, as the biggest example. We should not be in Iraq. We should not be in Syria. We should not be in Afghanistan. We should not provide aid. We should not try to control or influence those governments. Um, 
we should be entirely out. And I will say that we should also, at this point, withdraw all of our troops from uh, outside of the United States and bring all the troops home and stop meddling in the affairs of any other country. It doesn't mean we can't have alliances, alliances like the ones we have with uh, NATO and uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, for example. Those are those are good relationships, but we don't have to have troops in these other countries. Sure, absolutely. And um, and, and I kind of wonder if um, the Middle East didn't have any oil or, uh, you know, because there's so many trouble spots all across the world. Why do we pick those specific countries uh, to intervene? Um so, so peace, you know, it's something that everyone preaches and, um, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens here. And then you have your balance. How about, uh, deficits, debts? I, I guess that means, um, uh, how important is our national debt? I think looking at the debt clock, it's somewhere between 19 and tr- $20 trillion right now. That's exactly right. And, um, there's a very much a relationship between those two issues because we do spend very large amounts on our military and the wars we've been in. Um, the deficit this year will be between 600 and $700 billion, which that works out to around uh, seven or $8,000 per American family of additional debt that the government is adding this year. Um, as you said, the total national debt Official national debt will be around $20 trillion by the end of this year. And um, when, when something or someone falls into a black hole in outer space, you pass something called the event horizon, which is a point of no return. The event horizon is invisible. You don't know when you've passed it. And we don't know whether the United States has passed that event horizon, whether we are beyond the point of no return with our debt we certainly seem to be getting uncomfortably close. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good analogy actually. Um, all right. And now you have here, um, freedom and, uh, can you, I, I mean, that's a big topic. We probably talk all day about it, but, uh, you know, it is one of your platform topics here. If you could expand a little bit about what freedom means to you and what it would mean to your district, if you were, you know, selected, elected as representative to represent your district. I appreciate that. And the key point is, Thomas, that, and it's the core of the libertarian idea, that you and each of us, each human individual, are the indispensable agent of moral action and meaning on this planet. That you have a value that's independent of any government, any corporation, any movement, um, and that your free choices Uh, produce wealth, increase knowledge, create the next generation. And those free choices include voluntary associations, uh, groups that we put great value on, families, companies, schools, churches. So protecting those free choices with a system of individual rights to life, liberty, and property, that's the core belief. And that leads to interesting conclusions if you start with that premise that we should end the drug war legalizing marijuana nationwide and freeing all these prisoners who have not committed other crimes who are solely in prison because of marijuana uh, would be an excellent start. But end the entire drug war because drug prohibition kills people. It imprisons people. It harms drug users in addition to the harm caused by drugs themselves. And it does not stop drug use. Um, And by the way, ending the drug war would probably eliminate about half of all crime, all violent crime. Um, People commit crimes to buy drugs. People commit crimes in competition over illegal drug markets and so on. Um, Black Lives Matter. We've seen some some terrible examples in the last few days uh, that uh, thankfully the police officer in Tulsa, I believe, was just... uh, charged by the district attorney there with felony manslaughter where she shot an unarmed black motorist who was just standing outside of his car Um, and of course unfortunate incidents with the police occur with uh, people of all races as well but our black citizens are born the brunt of it Um, I would end civil asset forfeiture 
the government now steals more from us each year than all the burglars combined. And uh, I'll make one more point and then pause for a moment. But uh, I saw the movie Snowden today. Uh, very good. I recommend it. Oliver Stone's movie. We should eliminate the NSA's big brother spying on everyone in the United States and uh, elsewhere in other friendly countries, at least. Um, but uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, I think, um, yeah, so it's a little bit about focus. Um, you know, if if the cops didn't have to focus on drugs, per se, it could be a, a health issue or, or, or just a freedom issue, then they would have a lot more time focusing on real crime. And if the NSA wasn't focused on all of us, um, then they could actually probably focus on, you know, real legitimate things. And um, if, you know, if we even still needed an NSA, because we, of course, have lots of acronym departments, and so it probably save time efforts and lots of different things i hear what you're saying and i i didn't even know there was going to be a oliver stone snowden movie so that's very interesting i'll have to check that out of course i know about edward snowden and here's um a consensus issue i, I think you also put here no bailouts um you know why not let why not let's bail out the people who who failed at the expense of uh um, you know, the up and comers and have them not pay for it. What about that? Well, and that's a very good question. And um, I know I was personally affected by the uh, Great Recession. I was out of work for 14 months at that time. And when the time came that my home was about to be foreclosed on, uh, Fannie Mae, the same Fannie Mae that took $150 billion or so from the U.S. taxpayers, insisted that I sign a $25,000 promissory note before they would approve the short sale of my home. Uh, I signed, so I've been paying, I, will, I have 30 years to pay off that $25,000 note. But the difference between how, say, the little guy, if I may call myself a little guy in this case, was treated and how the, the giant businesses, the banks and so forth were treated, it's a fundamentally undermines the morality of, of the economy. And if you had followed libertarian policies, to, to, be, to be blunt, and I think that if you didn't have the Federal Reserve pumping things up with easy money, that's a different story. But let's say that you had been very libertarian just at that point, say nobody gets a bailout. There would have been short-term economic pain. You would have had companies like AIG failing. Perhaps General Motors would have failed. Economic readjustment. But preserving the moral basis of the economy that – you don't tax people to make up for other people's losses in the free market. To me, that's more important, and it's a better long-run strategy. So, uh, and and Ed Perlmutter, Congressman Ed Perlmutter, did support the the bailout bill. On uh, that's one of my differences with him. Wow. Um, yeah. If I, I that makes me think of a football analogy. I mean, if you had like, let's just pick a team, the Denver Broncos, and if you had a failing coach that failed over and over and over again i mean if you're going to keep rewarding that failing coach um you know and, and keep hiring them with a new 10-year contract and a bonus i mean you know what can you really expect i mean now if 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 you decided to fire them and and maybe hire a new college coach that has proven themselves i mean with the bailouts those big banks had failed Maybe some mid-sized banks might have bought them up, and then they would have had the management that you know didn't need the bailouts to restructure them and things like that. And we might be in a whole different situation now. Instead, we're just rewarding you know the people that had failed. And um, and so uh, so I hear you on that for sure. Um, now you have here, don't waste your votes. Um, you know. Uh, what do you say? What, what, what is that? I, I'm glad you asked because that's a huge issue right now. Um, the columnist Charles Blow, I believe his name is, who's normally rather intelligent about things, in today's New York Times was absolutely assailing and attacking people who would think about voting Libertarian or Green this year. And he said, oh, it was a childish protest vote. And it's nothing of the sort. If you write in Mickey Mouse, that's a protest vote. But when you vote libertarian or green or for another principled third party, you're voting because they have, in your 
judgment, better principles. And sometimes because they, especially this year, have nominated people of better moral character and better experience than the major parties. So um, we are seeing right now a situation where among millennials, there was a poll where 44% were supporting either Jill Stein, which I believe was about a third of that number, say 15%, and I think 29% or two-thirds of those supporting a third party were supporting Gary Johnson. Really, the wasted vote would be a vote for a Democrat or Republican because those two parties have created unsustainable debt, endless wars, failed government services, and major infringements on our liberties. Um, it is fair to say that the Republican Party was a good good party at the time of Abraham Lincoln and perhaps for a few presidents thereafter. Uh, they then became an imperialist party, a big government party with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And then uh, the Democrats with Woodrow Wilson introduced the income tax and the Federal Reserve. Uh, I can babble about American history for far too long. So anyway, let's not waste our vote any longer on Democrats and Republicans. Vote Libertarian or vote Green or vote somebody else, please. Yeah, and introduce some competition in the political system. Um, and the, the least risky place to cast a vote for a Libertarian or Green Party candidate, if you're someone who is thinking about Oh, okay. Looks like we have lost Martin here. Um, let's give him a call back, folks. What do you say? I think so. I think this conversation's getting pretty interesting. So let's uh, give him a call back. Sorry, I guess we got cut off for a moment. <laughs> That's all right. Well, we have the ability to call back. Hey, and that reminds me, Jill Stein actually just said the other day that she would hire Edward Snowden into um, some part of her administration. So that's that's a unique aspect of it. Um, and uh, so um, no, I was just saying that, you know, the least um, risky if someone is concerned, like if they're wasting their vote or not, the re least, least risky, that's a tongue twister, avenue to possibly, you know, take a risk on whether you want to vote for a third party candidate or an independent would be, I think, in the U.S. Congress. There's a body of 435 people. And if you had, let's say, even 50 independents or third party candidates, I mean, I would say that would be nothing but a good thing. I mean, it's not going to be the end of the world. You'd have everything to gain and, and really nothing to lose. And, and you're right. These would be people that would be a lot more principled. Um, so let's, um, and also let's, you did mention Congressman Ed Perlmutter. That sounds like your opponent there. So, you know, since you have that on the website, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, uh, opponent there as well and why you're the better candidate. Um, Ed's, Ed's been in office for several terms, I, I think eight or ten years now. Uh, from all reports, I have not met him, but he's a really nice guy. He does support a lot of mainstream things of the Democratic Party, uh, notably Obamacare, which has become a very definite failure, the uh, so-called death spiral of insurance premiums on the Obamacare exchanges is exhibit A for that. And um, But... Um, there are probably a few positions that I would share with Ed, um, but uh, I, I'm going to guess at one because I haven't heard him explicitly talk about a carbon tax. But one area where you could call me a green libertarian, I believe it's the right position for all libertarians to take, but I haven't persuaded a lot of my fellow libertarians about that yet. Climate change is very real, and uh, a carbon tax is an appropriate um, market economics based approach to uh, restraining and phasing out greenhouse gas emissions. I do support a carbon tax and um, I think there's sound basis and libertarian principles for that. So I think that's an area where we can learn from the green party. And uh, it's probably not the only area where we can learn Let me from the green party. Well, you can, well, follow up on that a little bit. Now, would that be a, a U.S federal tax? Would that be a, um, a like a UN tax? How would that go and where would the proceeds of that tax money um, be directed to after it was collected? Good questions. 
I think would, it would make most sense as a U.S. federal tax. Um, when you do a, a national carbon tax, it's appropriate to have a, a border adjustment. So when you have imports coming from a particular country, let's say imports are coming in from China, we get a lot of imports from there. You would need to then do some calculations of the carbon, the carbon footprint of those imports uh, based on how China is producing its power, a lot of coal-fired power plants over there. And then if China is not levying or controlling its emissions, uh, then tax uh, imports accordingly. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying this is a protectionist measure other than to protect the environment. I, I'm very much a free trader in general, but I, I think that the economics of the carbon tax, it makes sense. You have to adjust at the border. Um, and then uh, I don't know what, what World Trade Organization rules say about that sort of thing. I would have to consult with people who know more about it than I do. Um, as far as the use of revenue, uh, makes sense to fund some of the environmental work, the monitoring, the satellites that measure emissions and things, and some of the, the remediation, uh, dealing with the impacts and, and protecting species and so forth. That said, uh, one popular approach one, one approach that people use to try and make it politically acceptable is called fee and dividend, where the revenue is essentially rebated out to the uh, American people on a per capita basis. And there's been a lot of support for that. I'm, I would be reasonably flexible to try and get some sort of decent, reasonable carbon tax that achieves the goal uh, and then as you fully phase in a carbon tax, you can phase out special subsidies for wind and solar because the price system then takes care of things. But I would not let the perfect be the enemy of the good because you'd be working with a lot of other people in Congress and the administration to get something like that. All right. All right. And um, so now let me just follow up another question on that. What about just other types of taxes in general and um, and then – uh, I'll just segue into small and mid-sized businesses. So, um, so that that'd be the first topic. That's uh, I have a list of topics here I'd like to ask you about. So, how about small and mid-sized businesses, and then just federal taxes in general? Actually, okay. I'll yeah. address the taxes first because that has such an okay. impact on businesses. And I, I've operated as a as a one-person business in the past. Um, like Gary Johnson, I report, support fundamental tax reform and getting rid of the present tax system and replacing it with a new one. Um, I would have, other than the carbon tax, I would have just two federal taxes, a, uh, an in, a personal income tax at a flat 10% rate, just absolute flat 10% of all personal income, um, and then a consumption tax paid by businesses. Think of it as something like a value-added tax at a uniform rate not to exceed 10%. Um, that said, I've not, I don't have the resources to do the economic analysis to say that those three taxes would produce enough revenue. Um, I, I'm thinking that they would, just based on what I know about. Uh, federal government takes a, around 20 to 22% of GDP right now. So, um, but such a system would be so much simpler uh, by orders of magnitude, that your small businesses, everybody would have a much lower marginal tax rate. There's greater incentive for businesses to be productive and profitable. There's greater in incentive for laborers to be and employees to be productive and profitable. There's much less energy put into tax avoidance and tax reduction schemes. Um, and um, it would be a win-win-win-win for, for everybody. Um, since you asked about small business, I think that another issue for small business has been become the prevalence of uh, occupational regulation. Something like a third of Americans now work in regulated occupations. So you're told that in a particular state you can't braid hair without a license, things like that, things that are absolutely silly. I would get rid of government occupational regulation. Of course, the government can set its own rules for its own employees, like air traffic controllers and so on. But end all occupational regulation, and then leave it to the free market. 
if I go to a doctor, they'll probably be approved by the American Medical Association, but you might rather go to a doctor who isn't. Yeah, I heard like um, a lot of those types of regulations and those um, occupational type licenses, hair braiders and stuff like that. If those were elimin- a lot of those were eliminated, you know, it could it, stop preventing, you know, a couple million of jobs from uh, being created. And um, so uh, very interesting. And now you did already kind of cover over uh, military spending, foreign policy. Um, what about um, – you know, government contracts. You did go over bailouts as well um, and, and crony capitalism. What about government contracts and, um, and our, uh, our trade policies? And you kind of cover the trade policy a little bit with the carbon tax, but um, if, what, what, do you support like the TPP and, and some of these trade deals? And, uh, and, and, what, what else, and if you could expand into government contracts as well. Um. On the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I would say I'm undecided but leaning slightly in favor. So your your reader, your listeners should should presume the worst based on their own, own beliefs. Um, I prefer unilateral free trade. Uh, that said, the Cato Institute analysis, and, and they're a pretty good libertarian think tank, uh, was leaning in favor of it. I glanced at their analysis several days ago. Um, The government contracts in so many areas, notably in the defense and intelligence communities, they've just gotten totally crazy with spending taxpayer money with uh, no regard for value. So we have have a a fleet of new fighter planes that's going to cost half a trillion to a trillion dollars, and they keep being recalled because they don't work. They just grounded them again because uh, of another engineering problem. Uh, those are the F-35s, and yet the F-15s, which probably cost one-tenth as much, are still doing a very good job. Um, In general, we should have a much, much smaller government, and businesses should not be looking to government contracts as the way to, um, to a fortune. Think about the really great innovative businesses that we've had, um, Microsoft, Intel, Facebook, Google, I'm focusing on the tech sector there, but um, they have uh, generally developed without the government or much government involvement at all. Um, SpaceX and Tesla are sort of in-between companies because they do rely on some government contracts for for space launches and government subsidies for the electric cars. but it's fair to describe them as, as still as innovative private companies as well. Um, if, if you didn't have the current sunk costs of everybody expecting Social Security and Medicare and all the bondholders expecting their bonds to be paid off, if you were starting from scratch, you could have a federal government that would run on perhaps 2% of GDP rather than 20%. It would be one-tenth the size relative to the economy that it is today. The founding fathers and mothers, if they had seen the government we have now, they would have sworn an oath of loyalty to King George III and not even carried out the revolution. Right, right. It'd probably be a lot less tyrannical, right? Um, and, uh, and and most of the founding fathers would probably be in jail because of the drug war for growing hemp as well. Um, so uh, now – Talking about the founding fathers, who's some of your favorite past or present people? Um, you know, any time frame, uh, elected or not. Um, I like Thomas Jefferson, um, Gandhi, um, Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, these are fairly typical names to throw out. Um, the, uh, it was interesting because I, I'm a fan of Winston Churchill as well. And, of course, Winston Churchill and Gandhi did not like each other at all. And uh, as far as authors I've read, like many libertarians, I, I have a real soft spot for the fiction of Ayn Rand. But I also enjoyed reading C.S. Lewis, and those are two uh, figures who would probably not have gotten along. <laughs> that, that's a good point. I mean, you can admire people from you know different spectrums of the aisle there. Um, so what about, uh, you know, in your local election, 
Do you have any events coming up, any debates that you've already been a part of or that you're looking forward to and other types of events? Well, like Gary Johnson, I have not been invited to the debates. And um, so been a pretty relaxed uh, race as far as uh, I get questionnaires, I get inquiries and, and do this interview is great. Really enjoyed it. And um, did the Dragon Boat Festival. Um, and by the way, since I mentioned Gary Johnson, we know the presidential debate that only includes Trump and, and uh, Hillary Clinton is coming up on Monday night. And I just want to remind your listeners that in Gary Johnson, we have a man who worked his way through college, a self-made businessman who started with one employee himself and built up a thousand employee business, very successful. Then in his first run for political office, he becomes the governor of New Mexico and is one of the most successful governors in the country for two terms. And uh, then um, after leaving office, he climbs the highest mountain on each of six continents, including Mount Everest. Uh, and he, he's an endurance athlete, as well as a successful businessman, as well as an excellent gov governor, and a really decent, nice guy. And he, hasn't, he doesn't spend his spare time memorizing a list of the major cities of Syria. And that's the only thing that anybody has ever been able to criticize him for during his campaign. So... We have got the greatest guy running for president, and I hope uh, I hope all your listeners uh, take the time to support him. Yeah, I mean the the, the Aleppo thing—that's silly. Oh I mean, yeah, he, yeah. He knows what the policy is, and and that's the most important thing. And actually, Ralph Nader backed him up on on that point. Um, and uh, actually, I just remembered—I forgot a question. What about uh, any election? the election system do you think there could be any reforms regarding the election system debates you know score voting et cetera, et cetera? what proposals or, or things do you think uh would level the playing field or do you think it's the fine the way it is um and people just need to you know hold the representatives more accountable or a combination of both or something else we need a lot of reform in the election system uh I do support a constitutional amendment for direct election of president and vice president by popular vote, because right now the major campaigns only compete in what are called swing states. So you don't see a lot of active campaigning in, in a state that is, is solidly Democratic or solidly Republican. By direct election by popular vote, then every vote counts and every vote counts equally. Right now, a voter in Wyoming, his, well, if Wyoming were competitive, his vote would count more than a, a voter in California because of the electoral vote system. Anyway, direct election of the president by popular vote. Uh, ballot initiative and referendum and recall in every state. We tend to have that in the western states, but not in many of the uh, uh, eastern states. I think only about 20, 20 24 states uh, have ballot initiative, for example. Um, proportional representation in the legislature so that you can get different viewpoints, you, so that we can have Greens and Libertarians and Socialists and Constitutional Party people in state legislatures and in the U.S. Congress, which would take a constitutional amendment to change the, the makeup of the U.S. Congress. Uh, given that we don't have the same importance of states in a federal system now that we did at the time of the founding, it would be worth considering in any reform of Congress, making it a unicameral legislature, a legislature with a single house, uh, which um, I saw proposed recently, a pretty decent idea. Nebraska is the only United States state that has a unicameral legislature. Um, the approval voting system that uh, Frank Atwood promotes at, uh, I think, approvalvoting.org is worth looking at. People have talked about ranked choice voting and some of those other systems are worth looking into, but I think the proposals I've already cited are are perhaps the ones to start with. Yeah, the approval um, would be the easiest to implement because it would um, it's easily implemented to the existing voting voting machines that we already have. That's one point of it. And um, so, yeah, it's unfortunate that you're have haven't been uh, you know been able to participate in the debates. And um, you know, by keeping you out, 
they're actually keeping out the American people because um, our, you know, your well, your constituents' uh, tax dollars go to pay to print your name on the ballots and and etc. Ho- hopefully, people um, will oversee that. I mean, that's what we hope for. But um, uh, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate. But um, you know, uh, it, 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 this could be the year where, you know, you might just be able to ride the wave. <laughs> and, um, well, Martin, it's been a pleasure, and uh, we do appreciate your time to talk with us today and uh, to express your ideas to our audience. And it's Buchanan for FOR Congress dot org. And uh, that's who we've been talking with is Martin Buchanan, Libertarian candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, District 7 in Colorado for 2016. So the election is just uh, 40 plus days away. And um, well, thank you very much. Any final words, uh, Martin, before we end the interview? Just uh, everyone vote early and vote often. Yeah, vote early. You can do that. You don't have to wait in line. You can go ahead and, uh, you know, vote early. 